And we're joined now on the Bloomberg Google Hangout set at the U.S. African Business Forum by Rajiv Shah, the uh, administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development. It's such a mouthful compared to U.S. Aid, which is like the nice brand name. Here's our here's our development money uh, aid aid coming in. Uh, Africa as a continent uh, has nine of the t top 20 recipients of uh, American aid uh, from USAID. Uh, how how important is that money in the development of various African nations, leading off with Ethiopia, Kenya, Congo, and how much of it is uh, how much of it is, is sort of an attractor of private investment? Well, I think that's a great statistic because it shows uh, the America's commitment to Africa. Uh, the other statistic is that six of the ten fastest growing economies in the world are in Africa. And we've really tried to blend those two realities. So today we use the bulk of our aid and assistance to build the kinds of public-private partnerships that can help transform African agriculture, power African communities, and create opportunities for Africa's entrepreneurs. And that new model of development is very much uh, on display today. And President Obama will make some big announcements this afternoon related to it. I heard $14 billion in investments. How much of that is, how much of that is uh, coming from the United States versus from uh, U.S. businesses? I mean, the government versus business. Well, let me give you one example. Uh, we launched an effort we called the New Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition a few years ago. And we said, look, we need African countries to change their laws and improve their regulations around agriculture. And then we need businesses to invest and commercialize agricultural production to both move people out of poverty and to create jobs in rural communities. So in Ethiopia, we work with DuPont and Agco and a number of other companies to reach small-scale farmers. And we're helping to successfully reduce poverty. Today, we're announcing that uh, 38 companies, most of which are from Africa, are announcing an additional $2.2 billion as part of this new alliance. Uh, and it's really an extraordinary way to leverage American foreign assistance because we spend about a billion dollars a year on this program we call Feed the Future, but we're now leveraging billions of additional dollars of private capital. And can you talk a little bit um, about development and how much of it, and I apologize for not having a better metric than how much, but how much of it is uh, dollars and how much of it is technical assistance and other forms of uh, U.S. know-how going into, into other countries? Well, it's a combination of all of those things, but our goal at the end of the day is ending poverty through growth and improved governance. And so when we work in 14 African countries to expand and commercialize agriculture, we measure, are they growing more food? Are they moving themselves out of a condition of hunger and malnutrition? President Kikwete of Tanzania just told me that as a, when we started this effort, they were producing 70% of their food needs. Today, they're producing 130% of their food needs, and we're actually buying food from them to distribute in South Sudan and some places where there are more emergency requirements. So this work can be successful if we focus on delivering results and building public-private partnerships. Senator Kuhn just told me that uh, President Kikwete, Kikwete, Kikwete was meeting with uh, Purdue, the company poultry. here, poultry. They're interested in poultry, but the, uh, Purdue had not had an opportunity to meet with the president before. It had been you know, 10 years that they've been in the country. Uh, is that a problem? Do you see that as, uh, as being a, a challenge, generally speaking, on the continent? Or are there particular places where the government and the business may not be speaking to each other, even though they have a, a mutual interest? You know, it's absolutely true. And over the last five years, I'd say the big change in the way business is conducted is today there's much more engagement and dialogue between governments and businesses. And USAID is proud to often build the platform that brings companies, local and international, together with regulators and, and governments so that they can make the right choices. I'd also point out, though, of the countries that participate in this new alliance for food security, 90 percent of them have effectively made the policy reforms that they committed to, reforms like uh, eliminating export bans for food in Tanzania or uh, improving the regulation of the seed sector in Ethiopia so private seed companies can today reach 70,000 farmers. That's DuPont that's doing that. Uh, those reforms are just as important as our aid dollars and part private investment to helping to reduce poverty. How do you make a determination about whether a program is working or not and whether it should be funded more on the basis of it not working as well you, as you thought it should or funded less so that you can fund something else? Well, you know, just like I think many of your viewers do, we measure relentlessly and we report on real metrics. So 
in our agriculture programs. I can tell you that we reach seven million small-scale farmers around the world with uh, these types of efforts. I could also tell you that 12 million children in those families, which used to go hungry or be malnourished, today have adequate nutrition. And we know that not because we're guessing, but because we do household surveys, we study income gains for men and women, uh, we sample and measure child arm circumference and stunting rates so we know whether children are appropriately nourished. And we're bringing the science of measurement, including satellite-based crop imagery, to ensure that our programs are delivering real results. And frankly, that data is also very helpful to the companies that want to do more in these markets. It must, be, uh, it must feel good. I, do you feel like you're doing good around the world, you feel, uh, particularly in Africa, where you've got all this money that you're giving? I mean, $450 million to Ethiopia. Is that, is that a job with a lot of rewards? It, this is a job with tremendous re rewards, because we're able to demonstrate that our American commitment is bringing uh, companies, investment, corporate governance standards that are transparent and, and fight against corruption, while simultaneously helping sometimes the most vulnerable people in the world do better, not by receiving handouts, but by standing on their own two feet. And ultimately, that's the story of how our country developed, and it's the story of how hundreds of millions of people in Africa will join a vibrant global economy. And uh, we're welcoming on to the set uh, Ambassador Patrick Gaspard from uh, the U.S. Ambassador to South Africa. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on. Um, I want to ask you about uh, the uh, trade pact, AGOA, uh, which is being reauthorized. And I know it's, uh, it's been a little bit controversial of late with South Africa. It's a question of whether they will graduate from that uh, trade pact. I think that's the word that's used. Uh, do you expect them to be, uh, to be treated the same in the next uh, reauthorization or will there be a change? First, let me just say it's great to be on with a real leader like Raj uh, who's quantifying our success in the field every single day. On, on AGOA, uh, it's been a remarkably uh, successful uh, program for U.S. and uh, South Africa. Last year alone, uh, South Africa uh, imported into the United States $2 billion worth of duty-free goods, mostly uh, automobiles that have really helped to revive the industrial sector. Uh, in a part of South Africa that's really struggled over the last uh, decade or so. So it's hugely important uh, in South Africa, but it's, it's also uh, beneficial to us here in the United States. Uh, there's every expectation that when uh, Goa uh, is renewed that South Africa will uh, be, be a part of that. But I have to say that uh, given that we're here having a conversation about uh, investment, there are some issues in the investment environment in South Africa that we continue to be concerned about and that we're going to uh, press upon them to, to improve on. So what does South Africa have to do to uh, ensure that it's held harmless at the very least in the next uh, AGOA? Well, look, you know, uh, I think that uh, sometimes uh, when Americans think of South Africa, they think uh, rightly of a beautiful place like uh, Cape Town. They think of uh, downtown uh, Johannesburg. That's what you see in the news. But we need to understand that there are two distinct uh, South Africas. There is uh, a very uh, sophisticated uh, economy uh, in those cities, uh, but there is also a developing, uh, emerging, and struggling uh, economy in the, for the vast majority of South Africans. So there's every reason why uh, South Africa should continue to be in this kind of a program. However, we need to make sure that American companies, there are 600 American companies in South Africa, have an opportunity to play on a level playing field uh, and that uh, some of our goods, like U.S. beef, poultry, uh, pork, uh, have uh, uh, access uh, to South African markets as well. Do you feel that like those barriers have been too strong, that the trade ministry is uh, too protective? We're, we're, we're concerned uh, that uh, there are uh, barriers that exist that are completely uh, unscientific, don't make sense for the, sci for the South African uh, economy, and certainly don't help uh, South African workers uh, and uh, disadvantage U.S. corporations and we're working towards uh, resolving those issues. Mr. Shah, I want to ask you uh, what you hope to get from this conference. You're talking a little bit, we were talking a little bit before yeah. about some of the bilats that are going on on the sidelines here, uh, leaders talking to each other, business leaders talking to world leaders. What, what do you hope to get out of this summit, uh, not just in terms of the dollars, but what, what do you, where do you think this does for the U.S. relationship with Africa? Sure. Well, you know, we're, what we're doing at this summit is, uh, is what Ambassador Gaspar does every day in South Africa. I was just with him in Johannesburg a couple of weeks ago. And we are trying to build people-to-people uh, -people partnerships, real public-private partnerships that engage American investment, but also include African companies. And through our commercial engagement, we're trying to open up markets, reduce poverty, uh, ensure that the tremendous growth that is characterizing some of the fastest growing economies in the world is also pulling along with it 
the 40 or 50 percent of the population that lives in rural communities and may not be experiencing uh, those ki kinds of gains. And the good news is we've seen it in Ghana, we've seen it in South Africa, we've seen it in Tanzania, we're now seeing it in Ethiopia. The rates of child death, the rates of child hunger, the rates of dollar a day poverty that used to be the image of Africa are going down six, seven, eight percent a year. And we're confident, as President Obama said in this, each of the last State of the Union addresses, that we can end extreme poverty around our world and do it by also doing good for our companies and our investors. Ambassador Gessler, you uh, get to see as ambassador uh, sort of all the pieces of uh, U.S. engagement in South Africa. Can you talk to me a little bit about the, uh, you said there were, I think, 600 American businesses, you said, in South Africa? American companies. 600 American companies. How does that affect our foreign policy and your ability to uh, get the South African government to respond to things like uh, feeling their their protections? You know, I think there's a greater sense of our interdependence. Let me just say something on a personal note. It's a little surreal for me to be here at this conference. It seems that it was not that long ago that I was being arrested in front of the South African embassy asking our government not to invest in a country in Africa. And here we've come uh, full circle where we're having this kind of a robust uh, and, and dynamic uh, exchange. Uh, uh, as, as it relates to our, to our foreign policy, I think that the growing sense of connectedness, uh, not only uh, on, on, on the economy, but on peace and security uh, issues as well, uh, just compels us to uh, uh, work uh, in, a bar, in a bar partnered uh, way. Uh, it's true uh, on both sides. And if you, if you look at what's happened uh, on the economies, I think that Americans increasingly understand that uh, success in Africa uh, means success for us at home as well. Look at a company like General Electric. Uh, a decade ago, General Electric was generating about $500 million worth of uh, revenue from Africa. Today, last year alone, $6 billion in revenue generated by GE in, in, in Africa. That has compound effect uh, in the United States. That helps American workers, helps them to, to uh, uh, grow and sustain uh, their company as well. There are probably about 800 jobs in Kansas City that are, uh, that are there because of the relationship that Ford Motor Company has has uh, with uh, South Africa. This is hugely important for middle class workers uh, in uh, the states. They get it more. Our governments understand that and it forces us to work in, in, in a more important way. Can one of you help explain that a little bit in terms of, because you know the uh, Export impact, Import Bank has become this uh, sort of highly political football and the idea of U.S. investment abroad has become uh, increasingly political. And one, So one of the questions I have, and i uh, sort of uh, channeling other people's questions here, if you uh, if you have a, a U.S. company and invest in a foreign country, uh, say GE, and, uh, or uh, you just use the example of Ford, 800 jobs in Kansas City, I think you said, how is that building jobs here? And particularly if, uh, country, if we know a lot of companies that are investing overseas are uh, keeping their profits overseas. Well, you know, we work together on a presidential initiative and priority for President Obama called Power Africa. And uh, we're supporting dozens of power projects across the continent using this public-private new model of development. You take a small hydro project somewhere, Tanzania, which is one we just engaged in. The turbines for that hydro project can come from uh, Europe, they can come from China, or they can come from you know, a town near York, Pennsylvania, where they're made by a, a local American company. Uh, other countries have export banks that help improve the terms of finance for selling those turbines into these kinds of projects. And for us, the Export-Import Bank helps to play that role. So when those turbines are made in York, that's 400 jobs on the floor in Pennsylvania that helps keep communities vibrant. Uh, we work with student groups that are inventing new battery technologies to allow off-grid energy access to be successful. When an entrepreneur coming out of MIT or Berkeley or Duke succeeds by selling product into these programs, they're creating businesses and jobs right here at home. Can you guys talk about how that's integrated within the U.S. government in terms of uh, the various pieces? I know you, you probably are you're one piece uh, in various projects and you, you get to see it in one country. The various pieces of the U.S. government that come, uh, come together in terms of promoting U.S. Uh, business interests abroad? I'll, I'll that, well, that's what our I'll ambassadors do. I mean, to be honest, they, they, we, through Power Africa, Pres President Obama said, look, I want every part of the U.S. government working together to help power projects be successful in Africa so people have light to read at night and, and energy to start small businesses. The way that works is we all work together here in Washington. What really matters is that Patrick and, and his teams are presenting a common front. We're not 
42 different parts of the U.S. government in South Africa. We're all working as one team, one mission, and a mission set by our president, in this case, to help imp improve energy access. And uh, Ambassador Gaspard, uh, South Africa is one of the economies that uh, gets talked about a lot on the on the positive side, when you hear about uh, the, the big countries, the robust economies in, in Africa, and you hear about, uh, about Kenya and Nigeria and South Africa, where's South Africa headed? If you're an investor in the United States, and I don't mean give me stock tips or anything, but if, if you're <laughs> looking at investment, <laughs> if you're looking at investing in, uh, in South Africa, where do you think the future is there? Well, there's a vibrant new energy uh, economy uh, in South Africa. Uh, the South African government uh, is, is working on uh, building a coherent uh, uh, national infrastructure plan that I think presents real opportunities for uh, U.S. investors uh, because this is something that's going to be sustained uh, over the long haul. Uh, South Africa's um, uh, growth uh, has not been as explosive in the last uh, three years as some of the other countries uh, that you mentioned, uh, but they've managed to uh, maintain uh, the higher standards uh, on the continent over the course of the, of the last two decades. And do you foresee some of that being hydro? Uh, hydroelectric power. Uh, I know there's some nuclear. There's some nuclear power in South Africa, but there's also there some, some interest in. A, uh, I believe a dam in Congo. Uh, I could be wrong, but the, I'm curious. The, is that the, something the, the granting the granting yeah. of the dam, which the which, which South Africa is is involved in intense conversations with uh, with, with the Congo? Do you see that happening? Um, you know, I think it's a, an ambitious plan that we should all root. Uh, we, we should all root and hope that it happens because it's terribly important that we increase uh, power production on the continent for all the reasons that uh, Raj uh, laid out. Um, there are appropriate uh, in, environmental concerns and transparency concerns and good governance concerns. But this is something that should accrue to the benefit of, uh, of, of Africans, and that helps us in the long run. Just say that uh, your, your, your questions are, are the right ones, but we should understand that this is not all a zero-sum game uh, in the immediate. We should, we should understand, finally, in our foreign policy, what Henry Ford figured out a long, long time ago. All of what Raj uh, described uh, helps to uh, increase capacity uh, on the continent, and ultimately, that's going to actually grow and develop consumers for some of our goods from the state. So we have to have a, a long-term view of these issues. And no doubt, I think that's what a lot of the investors here are seeing. Thank you both so much for uh, being so generous with your time. Uh, it was uh, great to have you on, and we'll be back uh, at the Bloomberg News Google Hangout, Bloomberg Philanthropies. I'm sorry, Google Hangout here at the Africa Business U.S. Africa Business Development Forum. Uh, we'll be back in a minute. Thank you. Thanks very much.